Hello and welcome. My name is Justin Haynes and I'm a software development manager in AWS on the Amazon Linux team. And we recently built something called Bottle Rocket. It's an operating system specifically built for running containers. Bottle Rocket's open source and available in preview today, and you can find it on GitHub at bottlerocket-os. I want to take you on a bit of a tour of Bottle Rocket, but first want to make sure we understand what we're talking about when I say a container host OS. And we'll compare a little bit with uh, a full-fledged Linux distribution like Amazon Linux. Then we'll dive into what we built and why, followed by kind of how you might interact with it, whether for debugging or just exploring when you launch it for the first time. And we'll finish up with where we're headed next. So a container host OS. It's a Linux distribution that's purpose-built for running containers from the ground up. There are others in this space, but if we look at them compared with a full Linux distro, they share some commonalities. They're minimal, and what I mean by that is that they don't have any additional software other than what you need to run your containers. So this is things that get you into user space, a container runtime and your orchestrator, and not a whole lot more. Some of them, Bottle Rocket included, go so far as to not include a package manager or any way to add additional software at runtime. This is a pretty big deviation from a full Linux distribution where you have a full uh, spectrum of packages at your, at your fingertips. These full Linux distributions can run containers, but they could also be a database or a chat relay or a web server. Bottle Rocket has a narrow focus, but that doesn't mean you can't update it. A lot of these operating systems are updatable just like a full Linux distribution. But in a full Linux distribution, you tend to do that package by package. And in that world, there's a chance that that update can fail and leave you in an unknown state that's difficult to unwind and difficult to debug. Instead, these container operating systems tend to do this transactionally, whether that's through file system layers or, in the case of Bottle Rocket, with two separate sets of partitions where we download full disk images, validate them, and then can reboot into that new partition set. And if that fails, we can roll back to the prior working state. So what makes Bottle Rocket Bottle Rocket? We started with some core goals. The first was security. Amazon and AWS always start with security first, and so did we. We were able to build a very opinionated and specialized distribution that was highly secure because of our narrow focus. But just with that narrow focus, we didn't sacrifice flexibility. Today, Bottle Rocket works with Kubernetes, but there's no reason why it couldn't be extended to work with a different orchestrator like Mesos or Amazon's Elastic Container Service. Today, it works on AWS, but there's no reason why it can't be extended to work on other cloud providers, virtual machines, or even bare metal. Bottle Rocket's also transactional. I talked about that update from partition to partition, but it's also transactional in the way you interact with its APIs. You can stage a set of uh, changes, apply them, and roll them back if they don't work. And then finally, Bottle Rocket has an interesting notion of isolation. We run two container runtimes, one that your orchestrator or kubelet talks to. This is where your business logic applications and pods will run. And another, which is more tightly controlled and is special for running containers to manipulate the host system. So let's talk about each one of these in a little more detail. Starting with security, we started with SE Linux. And the goal of our SE Linux policy was to separate the containers that run in your orchestrator from the rest of the operating system. You can get around this, but by default, our policy very tightly restricts those containers so that they can't interact with the host system in any way. If someone is able to get around this policy somehow, we have additional mitigation measures in place. Most of the host OS is a read-only file system. And so if you do find yourself there, there's not much that you can actually change. If you are able to make a change, we use DM Verity. That validates each partition on boot. And so if someone was able to make a change that we didn't expect, the system wouldn't boot. And that's not ideal, but it's better than having a malicious attacker embedded in your system throughout reboots. The Etsy directory in Linux is one that stores things like configuration data for your running software. And it's generally something that needs to be updatable at runtime. So we can't make that read-only. Instead, we made it a stateless tempfs. It's created on boot and it's empty. And then we use helper programs to populate it with all the appropriate configuration bits. Bottle Rocket also doesn't have a shell or interpreters. 
And that's kind of wild. The way I go to debug a Linux system is to jump in there and start running commands in my shell. But if we look at this from a security perspective, interpreters and shells are purpose built to change the way programs are running or link one program to another in maybe unanticipated or unintentional ways. If we don't have a shell or interpreters, this just can't be done as easily. Also, all the binaries on the system, whether they're C, Go, or Rust, are built with a bunch of additional hardening flags. I have a link down here at the bottom to one of our GitHub, read, uh, GitHub documents that talks about these security features and more in a lot more detail. Bottle Rocket's also flexible. Different builds of Bottle Rocket are called a variant. So for example, we have a build, uh, a variant called AWS-KAS-1.17. And that tells me that this variant's built for running on AWS, so it knows things about the instance metadata service and user data. It uses the orchestrator Kubernetes, and it uses the 1.17 version of that orchestrator. We're currently building another variant called AWS-ECS-1. So again, that's for running on AWS. It uses Amazon's Elastic Container Service as the orchestrator, and it's version one, because ECS is versioned a little differently than Kubernetes. So you can think of these variants as just combinations of software, modeled settings to configure that software, and disk layouts. By default, our disk layout contains two sets of partitions to perform this transactional update. But if you're a customer who uses immutable infrastructure and replaces instances to apply updates, you might want to build a variant that doesn't have these two partitions and that doesn't have the associated software to validate and download those new updates. And that could be an immutable variant. You can almost think of Bottle Rocket as a set of tools to build container host OSs. So I mentioned Bottle Rocket's transactional updates from partition to partition. We use a framework called the Update Framework, or TUF, T-U-F, which is a CNCF graduated project with a reference implementation written in Python. We wrote our own implementation in Rust, and it's available on GitHub in AWS Labs slash tough, T-O-U-G-H. The update framework provides a wonderful way of mitigating against a bunch of common attack vectors by way of signed metadata that eventually points to these disk images and additional target files that we can validate as they come in over the air and know with a high level of confidence that nothing has been changed by the time they land on our disks and we try to boot them. We download those to this alternate set of partitions, and then we toggle the partition priority so that when we reboot, we land on that new updated set. And if it fails, we automatically fall back to the prior working state. Bottle Rocket also has this notion of isolated container runtimes. For the Kubernetes variants, we use containerd for both of these, but it could be swapped out for Docker or something else. One container D is the one that the kubelet knows about, and it's where your pods will land. It's very configurable. The other container D is for running what we call host containers. And host containers are often highly privileged, and they're made for manipulating the system. By default, there are two, one on and one off, and you can change these or you can add your own. The host container that's on, we call the control container. And in that container is the AWS Systems Manager and our API socket. This means that you can use remote commands to change configuration values and manipulate the system. The other container, host container, is called the admin container. It's off by default. And if you turn it on, it's Amazon Linux 2 in a container. And it lets you have that rich debugging experience with all the package ecosystem that you expect in a full Linux distribution. And we'll dive into more about how you might use that as we go on. But I want to walk back for a second and talk about these settings. And these settings are really important because they're the only way you can configure the system once it's built. They're just simple key value pairs. You specify them in user data if you want in a TOML format, or you can update them with our API. You can also write custom validation rules that are compiled at build time so that you make sure that these settings look the way you expect them to look, whether it's an IP address, a URI, or something else. Again, with a nod towards security, these are all written to a small and dedicated file system where only these settings live. And because they're validated both on write and on read, it's hard to imagine how someone could persist a, a, a malicious binary or something here within these settings, and we wouldn't see it. 
But not all settings are completely straightforward. Some of them we only know at runtime, so they can't really have a default. Some of them depend on other settings. Some need to be written out to a configuration file and a piece of software notified when that file changes. We saw this with metadata. So each setting can have some metadata associated with it. It can have something called a generator. So if this setting is missing, how do I create it? It can have information about what configuration files need to be written if this setting is changed and how they should look. It can have information in a template format about how this setting should be generated based on maybe other settings. It can also have information about the pieces of software or the services that need to be either started or restarted if this setting were to change. All this metadata is exposed through our API, but in a read-only form, because there's much too much control associated with being able to edit these metadata settings on the fly. Instead, they're configured at build time only. So let's take a specific example. We'll use the admin container. If I want to customize the admin container, I can specify the hostcontainers.admin.source in this Toml syntax in my user data. And this is a long URI that points at an Amazon Elastic Container Registry repository. And if I do this and I enable the admin container, I'll pull this container down, and that's what I'll run. If I don't specify that, there's no default for the admin container. Instead, we use a generator called Schnauzer and a template file that looks like this. So this almost points at just another ECR repository, but it has these curly braces that specifies the AWS region where we're running. That way we don't have to pull data from uh, across the world if we're running in a different region than the one that we set as the default. But that AWS region, we only know at runtime. Early in the boot process, we run a piece of software that can pull all the information out of the instance metadata service that we might need, things like the IP address, and the region that you're running in. Then things are handed off to a supervisor that knows about all the various generators on the system, and it runs them in order. When that generator runs, it goes and looks for any settings that it sees in its template and writes that new compiled setting out to the disk. Sometimes we need to make bigger changes though. It's not just changing a setting, but maybe we need to change the name of a setting, or maybe we even want to swap out an entire component of the system. Maybe we want to use Docker instead of Containerd. And we can do that during an update with migrations. If you're familiar with uh, traditional packages on a, on a Debian or an RPM-based system, when you upgrade these packages, you can define scripts that run that can do things like translate an old configuration file syntax to a new one or something like that. Migrations are similar in Bottle Rocket. They define two simple interfaces roll forward and roll back. And they all need to be static binaries because if we have dependencies on the host, we might be changing them out from under ourselves as part of the migration, so we wouldn't be able to roll back. They're also tied to individual settings rather than to variants. And the nice thing about that is that if you build your own variant and you say, oh, I want that configurable also, I'll pull that setting into my variant you'll automatically get all of these migrations over time as your variant is updated also. So we talked about what we built and why, but how do I use it? So you can launch a Bottle Rocket instance just like you would in any other instance. You can launch it through the console or the AWS CLI. We're also fully integrated with EKS Cuddle, so you can use that to spin up an EKS cluster with Bottle Rocket as your uh, uh, worker node target. Like I said before, Bottle Rocket's user data is structured TOML rather than an open-ended bash script or something like that. All you can set is these configuration values that we defined at build time. You can manipulate them after you start the instance with our API. And for further debugging, you can launch this admin container that I've talked about. When you're first exploring Bottle Rocket, I encourage you to set it enabled in your user data so that it's already there for you and you can explore more easily. And you do that with this first line where you set the enabled flag to true. If you're on a running system, you can do this after the fact with our API, of course. And you do this in two steps. The first stage is the change. And this way you can stage multiple changes at once and commit them all and roll them back in a group. And then the second, of course, is that commit step, the commit and apply stage. Once you do that, the admin container will start it runs an SSH daemon. It'll pull your keys that you've specified 
from the IMDS, and you'll be able to SSH into this container. This container by default is Amazon Linux 2, and so you have the rich ecosystem of packages and tools at your disposal. This admin container is also very highly privileged. We call it super powered. It's so highly privileged that it's barely still a container. It's in fact very easy to break out of, and that's intentional. This container is used for debugging and exploration, but not really in production. We supply a helper script called Sheltie that will performs this container breakout for you. It switches you into the host's namespace and uses a static bash so that you can have a shell there and you can explore. You can navigate to the settings directories, you can look at logs, you can look at config files and all those things that you might expect to be able to do on a normal Linux distribution. Additionally, we have a helper program called Logdog. Logdog does a lot of that exploring for you. It will collect the relevant logs, it'll collect settings, it'll collect running system information and configuration values, and it'll write them all into a tarball at this dot bottle rocket path, and you'll be able to ship that off the box so you can do offline debugging. Bottle rocket is also updatable. One of the ways we hope that you do that is with a Kubernetes operator. For those of you who don't know, an operator is just another pod, but it's specifically built to manipulate the cluster rather than to run your business. So the operator that we built uses Kubernetes distributed locking and our updates features. When updates are available, it will take a lock on a given host, cordon and drain that node safely and update into the new system. It does that with our update API under the covers. First, refresh updates checks for updates. If those are found, that's when the lock is taken and we start the cordon and draining process. Prepare updates uses that tough library that I talked about. It pulls the updates over the wire, validates them, and writes them to the alternate partition set. And then finally, activate update is the last step before a reboot where we toggle that partition priority so that when we do reboot, we land on that new partition set. Once we reboot, we're in the new updated version, it connects back to your cluster, and it can have workloads scheduled back on it. We've been working with a lot of ecosystem partners. And they've all validated their software and their customers' use cases on Bottle Rocket. If there are others that you work with, let us know, and we'd love to work with them too. As Bottle Rocket grows, we're looking towards the future. We have a GA and a 1.0 release here in the fall. And when we do, we'll be available in all the standard regions in AWS. We'll have released an ECS optimized variant that I talked about earlier. And Bottle Rocket will work, will work on all of the instances that you expect it to, except for GPUs. Those are coming in the future, but definitely on ARM. Looking further in the future, we're really excited about the idea of virtual machines for on-prem use cases. One of our first external issues was someone asking how we could get Bottle Rocket working on a Raspberry Pi. And we think stuff like that is super exciting and we can't wait to implement it. We also really like the Firecracker Micro VM project. The idea of micro VMs provides really wonderful isolation, especially in hostile multi-tenancy. So we'd look to things like the Firecracker Container D project to be able to leverage the power of containers in these orchestrators, as well as the security guarantees and benefits of a virtual machine. And then finally, I have these couple of question marks. And these question marks are really for you. Bottle Rocket's open source and it's on GitHub. And we wanna build a community around it. We feel that we built something that's extensible and flexible enough that it can be used for multiple orchestrators, multiple cloud providers, on-prem and even bare metal. So please tell us where you'd like to see Bottle Rocket go, whether that's uh, by feature requests or issues, bug reports, or even pull requests on GitHub. Thank you so much for listening. And we hope to see you soon over on GitHub at Bottle Rocket OS or on our tough repository at AWS Labs. Thank you very much.